talking mostly about perverse sheaves. On the whole, people that know about derived algebraic geometry don't know about perverse sheaves, so I'm going to lose the other half of you today, but never mind. Um, so this is joint work with a bunch of people, including Oren, um, someone who's not mentioned here, but who deserves to be, is Kai Berendt, so his influence is actually all over this talk, um, and um, I've also stolen a number of projects which uh, he gave talks about but didn't get around to fin finishing. So thank you, Kai, and Julian, you were right to be paranoid. Um, so just as some kind of orientation to where we're going, um, let's suppose that um, M is either a Calabian 3 moduli scheme or stack, or it's an intersection, um, I don't know, uh, L intersect N, a Lagrangian intersection in some complex or algebraic symplectic manifold, then we want to define some kind of cohomology of M, in quotes, uh, which will be in some sense a categorification of M. Um, so some properties we would like uh, would be that the Euler characteristic of this cohomology is either the Donaldson Thomas invariant of M, in the case we're in the Clar BR3 case, or the intersection number um, of L and N, in the case in which L and M are compact Lagrangians and some symplectic manifold. So we're looking to categorify either Donaldson Thomas theory of Calabia threefolds or Lagrangian intersections. Um, and so, for example, uh, if uh, M were a uh, spec of C of X mod X squared, a double point, then we'd want uh, H0 of M to be, well, whatever your field is, Q squared, let's say. Uh, so this cohomology theory, we want has to count things with multiplicity because otherwise we won't get the correct intersection numbers or Donaldson Thomas invariants. Um, and uh, also, as a, a note for the Lagrangian intersection case, um, Lagrangian Fleur cohomology uh, of L and N also has the, uh, if we're in a situation where we can do Lagrangian Fleur cohomology, uh, then its Euler characteristic is also L in set N. So if we can carry out this program, then this, in quotes, cohomology of the Lagrangian section we're going to get, uh, we should expect it to be somehow related to Lagrangian Fleur cohomology, which are the morphisms in the Fukaya category. So we're going, moving towards um, moving, defining some kind of uh, Fukaya category of, um, let's say, complex Lagrangians in the complex symplectic manifold. So that's uh, the directions we're going. Um, oh, sorry, my um, hand. Right. Um, okay. So uh, my numbering is continuing from last lecture. I'm going to start with two sections on what I call decritical loci. Uh, this is a kind of classical truncation of minus one shifted symplectic derived schemes and stacks. Um, it's a bridge between the derived algebraic geometry of yesterday and the perverse sheaves and other structures we might be interested in uh, today because I'm going to use decritical loci to um, define my perverse sheaves uh, my, by categorification. Um, then uh, these two sections are going to have uh, some conjectures in, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so... I'm going to start with a, a slightly uh, googly slide, but it's worth making the effort to understand this, uh, because if you do, then you'll follow the next ten slides, probably. Um, so this is something I need in order to define the structure of a decritical locus. So these are going to be alternatives to minus one shifted symplectic derived schemes, but they really are much easier. Okay? Um, so, uh, I mean, when I've not been working on... Uh, derived schemes for a month, I need to go on a training day in order to remember what one is. Um, but uh, because I'm not a derived algebraic geometer, 
by training, I'm more a differential geometer or a kind of flat algebraic geometer. Um, uh, these things, uh, you can more or less fit the entire definition of a, uh, a decritical locus on a single slide. Um, so, but this is a kind of prequel to that. So I'm taking X to be a classical scheme over a field K. Um, actually, K doesn't need to be characteristic zero for this part of the thing, but um, just some sufficiently nice field K. And I'm saying that, saying that there is a canonical sheaf, Sx, of K vector spaces on X. Sx is going to turn out not to be coherent, in fact, but it's still quite a nice sheaf, such that um, I'm going to give you a description of the um, restriction of Sx to the risky open subsets R in X. Uh, so whenever R is as risky open in X, and I, going from R into U, uh, is the closed embedding of this open set in X into a smooth scheme U, um, so that R is really a subscheme of U, and we write I of R U inside the sheaf of functions on U, so that the ideal of functions vanishing on the image I of R, which is isomorphic to R, um, then the, uh, the sheaf Sx restricted to R is isomorphic to the kernel um, of uh, a map D going from OU divided by the ideal squared into the cotangent sheaf of U, T star of U, divided by the ideal once times T star of U. So the ideal appears to all the two on the bottom here and one on the bottom there. Um, and you need the difference because when you take the D, uh, it can take uh, one of these powers of i into something which is no longer in the power of i, in the ideal i. Um, so also it turns out that this sheaf Sx splits, has a natural splitting into a kind of trace-free sheaf uh, and the sheaf of constant functions on x, where kx is a sheaf of locally constant functions from x into k. Um, so just to give you uh, another perspective on the same sheaf, um, to make it look a bit more canonical, at least if you know some algebraic geometry. Um, OK, if we have x is our scheme, then it has a structure sheaf, Ox. It has a cotangent complex, <coughs> Lx. This is now the cotangent complex of the classical scheme x, um, in the sense of Illusi. It's not the, um, the derived cotangent complex as I was talking about yesterday, um, and there is a D Durham map going from there. Uh, so this is a morphism of complexes, uh, but although both of these are complexes of Ax modules, this is not a morphism of, uh, this is not Ax linear. Okay, so here we have a, a morphism of complexes, so we can take the cone. This is a complex of K vector spaces on uh, X, and then we can take its cohomology sheaf in degree minus 1. So H minus 1 of this cone turns out to be isomorphic to uh, the sheaf Sx. So it is a, a sheaf which is very intrinsic to um, the, sheaf, the scheme X. It's something to do with obstructions, um, uh, and it has this alternative description in terms of um, what well, X has to be uh, locally a finite type, um, then it has its alternative description in terms of imbe if embeddings into smooth schemes. If x is smooth, then fx0 is 0, and fx is kx. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. so it's just the constant functions, because if x is smooth, then if a function isn't constant, it doesn't lie in the kernel of d to r. OK, um, so this is our interesting sheaf. Um, so as to what this means, uh, we're particularly interested in the case in which x is a critical locus. So if x is a, is a critical locus of a function f on a smooth scheme u, then we can take the open set R to be all of x, the map I from R into U to be the inclusion, and then F plus the ideal squared is a section of Fx because df vanishes on x because x is the zero locus of df. Okay, so if you have a critical locus, then uh, we automatically get a natural section of F Sx. Um, also, this may be slightly confusing if you're... It, uh, think you're thinking about uh, 
uh, kind of forms or whatever. It, uh, df is not necessarily, well, f is not necessarily constant on df inverse of zero if x is not reduced. But if you restrict to the reduced scheme, then f on the reduced scheme is constant, uh, at least locally, um, and if f is zero on the reduced scheme, uh, then f plus i squared is a section of f zero. Okay? Um, so f zero is, is the things where f is zero on the critical locus. Okay, so f restricted to x is just f plus one power of the ideal. Um, and f restricted to x need not be constant if x is not a reduced scheme. Um, so an f restricted to x is the obvious thing which makes sense on OX because it is just, it is just a function of x. Um, so what the theorem tells us is that f plus its ideal squared makes sense intrinsically on x uh, without any reference to a particular embedding of the scheme x into a smooth scheme u. Okay? So that's surprising. Um, so if x is a critical locus of a function f on u, you can remember f up to second order in the ideal as a piece of data just on x um, uh, and you know, it, quite independently of u. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I'm using the yes. Uh, so sections of the sheaf um, of kind of pieces of data. Um, uh, oh, so that section is not an intrinsic thing for x, but it's something that makes sense. It, that's, that's right. Yes. It, 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 well, it's an extra x piece of data on x, um, which uh, and that that piece of data on x doesn't require an ambient sheaf, an ambient scheme u. Okay. So we can use this to compare different ways of writing our scheme x as a critical locus. So let's suppose we know that x can be written as a critical locus of a function f on a smooth scheme u, and also as a critical locus of a function g on another smooth scheme v. So if x can be written as a critical locus in two different ways, then f plus the ideal squared uh, of x in u, and g plus the ideal squared of x in v, they're both sections of the same scheme, the same sheaf sx on x, so we can ask whether these sections are equal. So that gives you a way of comparing uh, isomor scheme theoretically isomorphic critical loci living in different smooth classical schemes. Okay, so this is relevant to the, um, the minus one shifted symplectic uh, Darboux theorem I stated yesterday, because then I said if you have a minus one shifted symplectic uh, derived scheme, then its classical locus, its classical scheme is um, the risky locally a critical locus. But of course, there's many different ways of writing it as critical locus. Uh, and here, I've come up with a, a way of saying, uh, of comparing different ways of writing the same scheme as a critical locus, and you can probably see where this is going. Okay? All right, so now let's define the critical loci. Um, this is a definition you can find in my paper on the archive in April last year. So, an algebraic decritical locus is defined to be a classical scheme, <coughs> X, locally finite type, uh, and a global section, S, uh, of this Sx0, the trace-free thing, I've decided I'm going to throw away the, the values of the constant on the, um, uh, on the critical locus, such that X can be covered by the risky open subsets R in X um, with an isomorphism I going from the risky open set R to the critical locus of a function F going from U into A1, where I use a smooth scheme, which identifies the section S restricted to open set R with f plus the ideal squared uh, for f a regular function on a smooth scheme u. Okay, so x and s need only locally be written as a critical locus. Um, we can find examples of decritical loci which do not have a global presentation as a critical locus. Um, okay, so decritical locus is a case scheme x which can strictly locally be written as critical locus um, because of f from u into a1, and the section s remembers f up to second order in the ideal uh, of the scheme X and U. Um, so there's also a complex analytic version of the same story uh, in which X is a complex analytic space locally modelled on the critical locus of F going from U into C, where U is a complex manifold and F is holomorphic. Sorry, yeah? If you're patient, we will get to, we, we will get to D modules. Um, I'm going to get, um, so 
from one of these guys, I will construct, well, and an orientation, I will construct you a D module. Uh, yeah. Well, um, well, what I, what, I, what I will do, or one of the things I will do, is F has a perverse D module of vanishing cycles, and I'm going to glue all those D modules together to give you a canonical D module on X. Um, but uh, as for other connections, I don't know. Okay, so there would also be a, a C infinity smooth version of these if you wanted them, uh, but I haven't written those down because I haven't found an, an application for them. Basically, um, if I'm either algebraic or complex analytic, I can do perverse sheaves, etc. I haven't got anything useful to do with uh, kind of smooth critical loci. Yes. Um, okay. Um, next, let's talk about something we call orientations. So let X and X be a D critical locus and X red, the reduced scheme, uh, subscheme of X. It turns out there's a natural line bundle K X of S on the reduced subscheme, which you call a canonical bundle, um, such that if you write X and S locally at a critical locus of F on U, then the canonical bundle is locally modeled on the square of the canonical bundle of U restricted to the reduced critical locus, where K U is the usual canonical bundle of the complex manifold U, or <coughs> smooth scheme U. Um, you may be confused by this square, uh, but that's kind of the point. Um, it's, it turns out that the squares of these things glue naturally. Um, so uh, if you take a, an open cover of this thing by things written as critical loci, then there are natural isomorphisms between the squares of the KUs, um, and you can glue them together to get a global line bundle. If you did this without squares, then they would not glue naturally. They'd only glue up to signs. Um, sorry? Yeah, uh, probably. I know this, um, this business of taking square roots of line bundles crops up a lot. Um, uh, and it, again, for instance, Conservation and Zoidman orientation data. Um, and uh, quite a lot of people, when they've write their first paper in the field, forget about the square roots, um, uh, including even Conservation Zoidman uh, the first time around. Um, okay, so let's make a definition. Uh, well, sorry, before we do that, let me say a reason why KU square would be natural is let's think of this as a derived critical locus instead of a classical critical locus. So the derived critical locus of this has a cotangent complex TU in degree minus one and T star U in degree zero with D2F mapping between them. So if you took the, uh, the determinant line bundle of that complex, you get a KU from the T star U in degree zero, but you'd also get a KU from the TU in degree minus one because you take the top exterior power of that and you raise it to power minus one. Uh, so the, the determinant line bundle of the cotangent complex of the derived object really is a square there, and that's kind of why the square is natural. Okay, so... Given a decritical uh, let me also say that I haven't got a very good explanation for why I need to restrict to reduce subschemes. If somebody knows, do, do tell me. Um, so I don't, I don't know that this KXS doesn't actually def exist naturally on the full scheme X. Uh, it's just I can't prove it does. And, uh, okay. So um, I suspect it doesn't, but I, again, I haven't got a good reason. Okay, so I define an orientation to be a choice of a square root line bundle KXS to the half for KXS on the reduced subscheme. Okay, so this is related to the notion of orientation data in Conservation and Zoidman 2008. This was their um, paper on uh, motivic Donaldson Thomas theory. Um, it's not quite the same thing because they only required a constructible square root, which always exists. Uh, in their paper on cohomological Hall algebras, uh, they they wanted an actual square root rather than a constructible square root. Uh, but they, are, they also require some compatibility with um, short exact sequences in, in a Calabian 3 category, which we're not imposing at this stage. 
Okay, but the idea certainly came from them, originally. Um, and we need this orientation for various reasons. Basically, you need orientations as soon as you go beyond Donaldson Thomas invariants, which are just numbers. If you want to do specific Donaldson Thomas theory or categorified Donaldson Thomas theory, then you have to have these orientations. Um, okay. So now let's talk about a, how this is related to yesterday's lecture. So let's take bold x and omega to be a minus one shifted symplectic derived scheme. For example, a derived moduli uh, scheme of coherent sheaves on a Columbia threefold, or uh, a derived intersection of two Lagrangians in an algebraic uh, symplectic manifold. Then, uh, the classical scheme X, which is the truncation of bold X, uh, has a natural extension to an algebraic decritical locus X and S. Uh, furthermore, the classical, the canonical bundle of X and S is the determinant line bundle of the cotangent complex of the derived scheme bold X restricted to the redu uh, classical reduced scheme uh, of X. Okay, so this is really a truncation functor <coughs> from minus one shifted symplectic uh, derived schemes to algebraic decritical loci. So examples show that this functor is not full that is, you can get distinct minus one shifted or non-equivalent minus one shifted symplectic derived schemes uh, which map to the same or isomorphic decritical loci. Um, now, in fact, it's not as quite as bad as that. Or, okay, it is exactly as bad as that, but no, no more. Um, in that locally, the decritical locus recovers the minus one shifted symplectic derived scheme fully. Um, because I'm locally, a decritical locus tells you that the thing can be written as a critical locus, uh, and the, that critical locus is exactly x and omega up to equivalence. It's just the way things are stuck together, uh, some non-local information is stored in here. Um, so you could think about decritical loci as being equivalent to what you get if you kind of thought about minus one shifted symplectic derived schemes with their open sets as forming a pre-sheaf and then sheafified. Okay, the information which is forgotten in, by this truncation functor is the strictly non-local information. Um, so, for example, the cotangent complex of this, it's a complex, it's not a sheaf. Um, it, can, can, it, can, can, it, could, it could be, uh, you could get complexes which are kind of globally non-zero, but a, a zero when you restrict when you open set, or uh, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, or, or morphisms of complexes do that, can do that. Um, so it's only the slightly weird non-local information which is forgotten. Um, and we think about decrypted loci as classical truncations of these minus one shifted symplectic schemes. Um, so uh, an al alternative, uh, what you could call semi-classical truncation, uh, which was used a lot in Donaldson Thomas theory, uh, is schemes with symmetric obstruction theory. This is something invented by Kai in a uh, lovely paper back in 2005 or so. Um, so schemes of symmetric obstruction theory are great from the point of view of dealing with Donaldson Thomas invariants as numbers. Um, but uh, I'm, where this project started, really, is with me having spent a year attempting to use schemes of symmetric obstruction theory to build perverse sheaves um, or to build um, motivic invariants and failing miserably. Uh, and I'm now convinced that that's not actually possible, that the schemes of symmetric obstruction theory do not contain the information we want. Um, uh, so decritical loci appear now to be more, be more useful for the purposes of categorifications and motivic um, Donaldson Thomas theory. Okay, so the corollaries from uh, the last lecture tell you two things. Firstly, uh, if Y is a Calabria threefold um, over some field K, uh, well, I suppose K now has has characteristic zero, and M is a classical moduli scheme of coherent sheaves or of complexes on Y, then M extends naturally to a decritical locus M and S. Uh, we can also identify the canonical bundle. Um, that is the determinant of a complex E uh, restricted to the reduced subscheme where E is the natural symmetric obstruction theory on M because this 
uh, you know, which has been, been known in kind of classical geometry for a long time, uh, is in fact isomorphic. E is really the cotangent complex of the derived moduli scheme restricted to the classical moduli scheme. Um, and that's the natural thing induced by the, uh, map, the inclusion of the classical thing into the derived thing, thing on cotangent complexes. Okay, so Calabi, our three moduli schemes are naturally decritical loci. That's just a kind of way of packaging up the fact I told you yesterday that Calabi R3 moduli schemes are locally critical loci. Um, I'm now saying that they're locally critical loci and the functions which they're critical loci of uh, are all compatible in the sense that they define the same section of uh, this chief SM. Uh, a second corollary is that if we take a, a smooth symplectic scheme, uh, classically, so not symplectic in the PTVV sense, and L and M are smooth algebraic Lagrangians in S, then PTVV tell us that the derived intersection, L intersect M, is minus one shifted symplectic. So then you truncate, um, and then the classical intersection, L intersect M, as a classical scheme, extends to a decritical locus X and S. So, um, the canonical bundle satisfies KXS is uh, the canonical bundle of L, respect to the reduced scheme, tends with the canonical bundle of M, respect to the reduced scheme. So the canonical bundle of S does not appear because it's naturally trivial anyway. Um, okay, so therefore, if you have choices of square roots, KL to the half and KM to the half, for the, square, the canonical bundles of the Lagrangians, then you put these together, you get a square root of the canonical bundle that gives you an orientation for the um, thing here. So therefore, choices of square roots on Lagrangians of canonical bundles of complex Lagrangians is a natural thing to consider uh, to, to associate to a Lagrangian in this scheme. Uh, if you have any background in Lagrangian Fleur theory, um, you might like to know that complex Lagrangians are automatically oriented, but choosing a square root of the complex, uh, the canonical bundle corresponds to choosing a spin structure. And if you want to define the Lagrangian Fleur cohomology of a Lagrangian, some of the first things you have to choose is an orientation and a spin structure. Okay? Um, because you need those to orient moduli spaces of j with curves. Uh, so, actually, an alternative name for these orientations would be spin structures, but for various reasons, we've, got, we've gone for orientations. Okay, so my student, Vittorio Busi, has, in fact, actually finished proving that this extends to complex Lagrangians and complex symplectic manifolds. Um, obviously, you'd expect that, but uh, this proof goes via PTVV, who are using derived algebraic geometry, um, and until uh, Ezra gets his act together, uh, we don't have uh, a theory of derived complex analytic geometry um, uh, in which to apply the same thing. So we're using much lower tech um, things in order to prove uh, that complex Lagrange intersections uh, are um, equitable loci. Okay. Um, so all of this thing has uh, an extension to stacks, um, which is quite boring. So Oren wrote this bit. Um, and I think I'm going to flip through it quite quickly. Um, so we can generalize this to R times stacks. You would need a good notion of sheaves on R times stacks, which is already well understood. So essentially you define sheaves on R times stacks to be a choice of sheaf S of U phi for every, every smooth atlas, every smooth morphism phi going from U into X with U a scheme. So whenever we're dealing with R times stacks, the idea is we just reduce things to the same question on schemes U which live over X by a smooth morphism. Um, okay, so a sheaf S on X assigns a sheaf on U for every scheme U with a smooth morphism to X and a morphism, whenever we have a triangle with U and V schemes, um, phi and psi smooth maps, alpha doesn't have to be smooth, each of the two morphism of stacks, um, then you want a pullback morphism, S of alpha eta, taking the pullback of the sheaf on V the sheaf on U mapping in there, and quite often this is required to be an isomorphism. Um, for instance, if alpha was smooth or whatever, um, uh, this, this will be an isomorphism if, if the sheaf is Cartesian or something like that. Okay? Um, and you require these kind of transfer maps, S alpha U, to have the obvious associativity properties. If you had two triangles, you can compose to get a third triangle, the obvious things happen. Okay, so you can pass from stacks to schemes by working with smooth atlases. Um, so 
there's now an obvious generalization of d critical loci to stacks. Um, so on each scheme u, you've got a tonal sheaf S0 of u. Um, if you have a morphism of schemes, alpha from u into v, uh, that turns out to be a natural pullback morphism uh, from the pre-image of the sheaf of the v sheaf on u into the S0 of u, which has the obvious associativity properties. So therefore, uh, on any classical R times stack X, you get a natural sheaf of K vector spaces, SX0 on X, uh, which assigns to each smooth atlas U, uh, the, scheme, the sheaf S0 of U, uh, and to each triangle, um, like that. Well, that shouldn't say two, that should say one, sorry. Um, uh, the, just the pullback morphism going between the pullback of the sheaf from V to U. Um, Okay, so uh, a global section uh, of this sheaf on X is, consists of a global section on each smooth atlas um, with the obvious pullback properties. Um, and a decritical stack, uh, well, a, a stack S with a global section S of this sheaf is a decritical stack if all of the atlases are decritical loci. Okay, so that is, if X is a decritical stack, then every smooth atlas phi from u into x as u a scheme um, uh, makes u into a decritical loci. Um, okay. All right, so then as for the scheme case, uh, we get a classical truncation functor from minus one shifted symplectic derived stacks into derived R time stacks, not general derived stacks, uh, into uh, decritical R time stacks. Um, which makes the canonical bundles agree. Um, and the corollary is that if we have a Calabria threefold over K and now a classical moduli stack of coherent sheaves F on Y or of complexes in the drive category with no negative X, then uh, the, this classical moduli stack extends naturally to a decritical, sorry, that should say a decritical stack um, with canonical bundle uh, given by the determinant of the natural obstruction theory. Okay, so. All this is very dull, but it's important because it's going to tell us that uh, we can do Donaldson-Thomas theory for moduli stacks rather than just find moduli schemes or whatever. Okay. Um, and, whoops, now it happened. Um, so can I ask, why are one stacks of special interest here? Is there a geometric reason? Because uh, I'm too stupid to understand two stacks. Um, Uh, well, it, it, for some reasons, it, for some things, it's enough. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to prove um, wall crossing for Donaldson Thomas type invariance in the drive category, uh, it's enough to do things that look at things with no negative x, because anything which lies in the heart of some abelian category has no negative x, and you can go, if you're, if you're going to go a kind of do wall crossing between uh, two distant things, do two distant stability conditions that are a long way apart, in the modelized space of stability conditions. You can do it by doing a, su a succession of small transformations. Uh, and small transformations you can always understand in terms of working within a single ab abelian category, basically. So for some applications it would be enough. Um, and uh, okay, if, if I finally got my hand head around what a, a higher stack really was, then I would probably be able to give a better answer to that question. Um, but and if I wasn't frightened of higher stacks, I'd probably be working just with the drive thing anyway. Um, okay, so now I'm lost. Um, okay, so uh, yeah. Okay, we have a classical, we have a truncation functor, um, which does the right things to canonical bundles. Um, we have that corollary. Uh, okay, so we define orientations um, in a fairly natural kind of way. Uh, let's skip over that. And okay, right. So now we get to the, the bit um, I'm really wanting to talk about, which is categorification uh, using perverse sheets. So now we're back. To, we're, let's go back to schemes now. So here's our theorem um, in that paper on the archive in 2012. Um, if X and S is in well, okay. This went on the archive in 2012, but I didn't invent um, decritical loci until 2013. Um, and so the paper got revised, obviously. Um, <coughs> uh, so X and S is an algebraic decritical locus over K, 
with an orientation, then we can construct a canonical perverse sheaf, Pxs on X, such that if the decritical locus is locally modelled on a critical locus of a regular function on the smooth scheme, then Pxs is locally modelled, uh, locally isomorphic, to the perverse sheaves of vanishing cycles Pv of Uf uh, on here. So in the same way, uh, the, exactly the same construction works for D modules, uh, and if the field is the complex numbers, then for mixed hodge modules. Basically, we're using the kind of just a sort of general package of properties of perverse sheaves, uh, the, kind of the, the six functors, or we don't, oh yeah, probably only one, one or two of the six functors, uh, and in particular, uh, the, the vanishing cycle functor and its properties. Um, so as long as we've got things which look like perverse sheaves, living in a abelian category, so perverse sheaves form a stack over the, um, in the risky topology, let's say, um, and uh, have vanishing cycle functors, then we can build one of those. Um, so I was talking this morning uh, with someone about trying to do the same thing for uh, morel Vavolsky motives, uh, and that may be possible, but uh, uh, that there'd be rather more work to do there because of uh, the, the things not forming in Bean category necessarily. Okay, so roughly speaking, we prove the theorem by taking his risky open cover, uh, Ri of X, where each Ri is uh, isomorphic to a critical locus of Fi on Ui, and showing that the perverse sheaf and vanishing cycles Pv of Ui Fi and Pv of Uj Fa are canonically isomorphic on the double intersection Ri intersect Rj, uh, so that we would ho then hope to glue these perverse sheaves to get a global perverse sheaf P X S on S using the kind of fundamental property that perverse sheaves form a stack in the Zariski or Etal topologies. So in fact, things are a bit more complicated than this. It turns out that there are local isomorphisms between these two sheaves, but they're only natural up to sign. So to make them really canonical, we have to use the orientation K X S to the halves to define certain natural principle Z2 bundles, QI, on each open set Ri, so that when you twist the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles PV of UI FI uh, with this principle Z2 bundle QI, that the I version of that becomes naturally isomorphic to the, Q the J version of that with no sign ambiguity. Uh, and then we glue these perverse sheaves of vanishing cycles twisted by principle Z2 bundles to get our sheaf here. Of course, well, um, usually you can, well, certainly if you're in the complex analytic uh, case, that there is a complex analytic version of this theorem. In the complex analytic case, you can always take the QIs to be trivial, but they're not canonically trivial. Um, okay, so um, one corollary tells you that if Y is a club, you have threefold over K, um, and M is a classical modulized scheme of coherent sheaves or complexes on Y. Uh, with the kind of symmetric construction theory going from E into LM. So if we suppose we're given a square root for the determinant line bundle of this construction theory, which is basically orientation data in the sense of concept of Zobman, under these conditions we have a natural perverse sheaf PMSX FMS on M. Um, so this is a project which Kai Berendt uh, was talking about uh, quite some time ago. Um, okay, so there is a paper by Keem and Lee uh, on the archive which does something fairly similar, at least over the complex numbers. Um, the kind of inputs for their construction are um, my old proof that uh, Calabi-Yau moduli schemes are critical loci using gauge theory and complex algebraic geometry. So they're using the kind of gauge theory version rather than this derived algebraic geometric version of the same thing. And they also burgled our, um, uh, our perverse sheaf paper to get a result which tells you that you're allowed to glue these things together. Um, okay, so one reason why you might be interested in this is that once you've got this perverse sheaf, you can take its hypercohomology. Uh, the hypercohomology is a finite dimensional graded vector space, well, if M is a finite type at least. Um, and it's the point where the Euler characteristic of the perverse sheaf. Uh, is the Barent function um of m, so Kai Barent uh, already wrote this down um, a long time ago, and therefore, uh, as Kai also wrote down, the 
um, the weighted, well, the just general properties of perverse sheaves will tell you that the Euler characteristic of the hypercurve module of this perverse sheaf is the weighted Euler characteristic of the moduli space weighted by its parent function. Um, okay, so th this is a con constructible function with values in the integers. And by Kai's paper back in 2005, uh, this right-hand side is just the Donaldson-Thomas invariant of the moduli space model scheme, M, at least if M is proper. Uh, if it's not, we could basically define this to be the Donaldson-Thomas invariant. Um, and therefore, um, this hypercurve module of this perverse sheaf is a graded vector space uh, whose dimension is the Donaldson-Thomas invariant of M. So it's a categorification of this Donaldson-Thomas theory. Um, this is, could be interesting for a lot of reasons. Uh, for example, uh, in the string theory, the string theorists tell us that um, Donaldson-Thomas invariants of Calabi-R threefolds should be interpreted as numbers of BPS states. So, as far as string theorists are concerned, BPS states are some finite dimensional vector spaces they find in their theory. Uh, you know, the, the cohomology of some operator which squares to zero. Um, and so it's natural to expect that actually these, these hyper cohomologies should be interpreted in string theory as vector spaces of BPS states. Um, and, okay, next we're going to go on to cohomological whole algebras at some point. Those maybe are algebras of BPS states. So, um, there's various there's reasons coming from various different kind of areas of motivation that says that these are interesting things to look at. Okay, uh, we can also um, look at Lagrange intersections. So, let's suppose S in omega is a classical smooth symplectic scheme uh, of dimension 2n, let's say. Um, and L and M in S are smooth algebraic Lagrangians uh, with where we choose square roots KL to the half and KM to the half of their canonical bundles. Um, then we have a natural perverse sheaf PLM on the classical intersection S is L and sect M. Um, by, well, we take the decritical structure um, on X coming from uh, the previous result and these things give us um, uh, an orientation of that decritical structure, so then our theorem gives us the first sheaf there. Um, and, yeah. So, Vittorio Bussi has basically already extended this to complex Lagrangians in complex symplectic manifolds. Um, so, this is a repeated, re related to a paper by Kai and Barbara in 2009, um, which I know, this, this kind of inspired us to think about this. Unfortunately, there are a few points in uh, their paper, which are differently right, um, which confused us for quite a long time, actually. Um, but, anyway, okay, so the hypercohomology of this perverse sheaf, we think about it as being, more or less at least, related to the Lagrangian Fleur cohomology, HF star of the two Lagrangians, by the ith hypercohomology of the perverse sheaf is the Lagrangian cohomology here with uh, a shift of n. So this at least in the compact case, this has some uh, uh, Poincaré duality centered around zero. This has Poincaré duality centered around the dimension n, so that's why you ought to have a shift of n there. So we would like to define uh, Foucault categories, in some sense, for algebraic Lagrangians or uh, complex Lagrangians in algebraic symplectic manifolds or complex symplectic manifolds, and uh, I will talk about that uh, later, towards the end of the lecture. Yeah? Could I think of this perverse sheaf as somehow the dual of the derived intersection structure sheaf, uh, the mirror dual? Uh, hey, what is the right. model I'm um, I don't know. Um, perhaps you can explain what you mean to be that by that later. Um, uh, the vanishing cycles. Yeah. 
Okay, can we move on? Um, right, so this whole thing has an extension to our own stacks. Um, so if we take given a, a decritical stack with an orientation, then for all smooth atlases, uh, the atlas itself becomes um, a decritical locus with an orientation. So then we get a perverse sheaf on U. You can more or less define perverse sheaves on X and S to be an assignment of a perverse sheaf on each smooth atlas. Um, actually, that's an oversimplification. Uh, if you did that, you would, that would give you a nice abelian category of perverse sheaves, but it would not give you uh, a kind of triangulated category with all of your six, six rotten dig six functors. So actually, you need to do some more work. Well, somebody else needs to do some more work um, and uh, to define the to develop the theory of perverse sheaves and constructible complexes and so on on our time stacks, which they have. Um, uh, but then it, it turns out that once you develop the whole theory, you can really re regard a perverse sheave as just being perverse sheave on each smooth atlas with um, isomorphisms and the pullbacks here where you have to insert a, a, uh, a shift by the relative dimensions of uh, the smooth map slab. Okay, so all of this data is equivalent to perverse sheaf on uh, stack X. So we get a, a theorem which says that um, any decritical stack with an orientation carries a natural perverse sheaf. Um, therefore, if you have a Calabi R3 fold and a classical modulized stack of coherent sheaves on your Calabi R3 or of complexes with no negative X, um, and let's suppose we have a square root of the determinant line bundle of the obstruction theory, uh, then we can get a, a natural perverse sheaf on the R-time stack. Um, so then you can form its hypercohomology. Um, this should no longer be finite dimensional, I expect, in the F-stack case, but you can regard it as being, some, in some sense, a categorification for the Thomas, Thomas, Thomas theory of, of the Calabi R3 fold. Uh, and this is an aspect of things I haven't thought about very hard at all, but maybe one day I'll get to do that. Um, okay. Um, now I want to talk about uh, a conjecture uh, I would like to make because um, I'm hoping that somebody here might be able to help me with it. So let's take x and omega x via minus one. Oh, well, well, so wh where we're going with this is we've now defined the perverse sheaves uh, which give us a hypercohomology as vector spaces. Uh, we're interested in putting some kind of algebraic structure on these things, for instance, a multiplication um, or kind of composition of, if we want to regard the hypercohomology of the uh, Lagrangian intersection perverse sheaves as being Lagrangian fleur cohomology, then we want to know how, to, how, what, how do the composition maps between Lagrangian fleur cohomology uh, arise in the perverse sheaf picture. Um, and I think it should happen through this conjecture. So I'm going to go back from the critical loci to um, the PTVV language, <coughs> although there should be a truncation uh, of uh, all this to a kind of decritical picture as well. Okay, so let's take x and omega x to be a minus one shifted symplectic drive scheme. Uh, and then L, a Lagrangian in x in the sense of PTVV, which I talked about yesterday. So we choose an orientation for this shifted symplectic thing. There's then a notion of a relative orientation for the Lagrangian. I could tell you about that if you wanted. So we choose one of those as well. Uh, now, uh, the result I talked about a few minutes ago tells us that we get a natural perverse sheaf on X um, by the BBDGS result. So I conjecture that there is a natural morphism in constructible complexes on the Lagrangian L um, from mu L starting from the constant sheaf on L shifted by the virtual dimension of L into the shriek pullback of this perverse sheaf on X. Okay? Um, and I... I will conjecture also that I could tell you what the, the local model for this map is in Darboux form presentations for X and L. So this conjecture has some important consequences. Okay, so I already know local models for um, this, this the Lagrangians. Okay, well, so I've told you the, Dar the Darboux theorem for uh, shifted symplectic things. So there should also be a derived Lagrangian neighborhood theorem, which gives you local models for Lagrangians inside the local models for the shifted symplectic things. So that's something I'm uh, working on with Daniel Barraldo. Um, and so if we know, uh, if we know those um, 
derive Lagrangian neighborhood theorems, at least in the minus one shifted case, then I can tell you what mu L is. It's, you apply a vanishing cycle functor to some natural morphism of, of uh, constructible sheets. Now, but what makes this conjecture difficult, at least for me, is that, that these local models are not enough. Uh, this mu L, oops, uh, this mu L here, it's not a morphism of sheaves, uh, it's a morphism of complexes. Um, and morphisms of that kind, they don't glue like sheaves, they're, they're non-local. So you could imagine a case in which mu L is globally non-zero, but zero on the sense of an open cover. And I only really understand how to do things on um, a single open set, or possibly two open sets. Um, but to construct mu L, we'd have to do a gluing problem in an infinity category, probably using hypercovers. So I do have a sketch method for doing this, uh, but it's rather a mess, uh, and I'm wondering if there's a better way of doing it. Um, so maybe gluing local models naively is not the best approach. Um, we could do it with some other technology. Um, and I'd be grateful for any suggestions. And one problem seems to be that we don't have a good definition for the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles. Um, you know, uh, one would like a definition which just lives naturally on the critical locus. But somehow all the definitions I know, they live on the zero locus of the function. And so it's, it's kind of... Um, but... It, for the problems I'm looking at, the zero locus of the function isn't real. It, 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 uh, it's only the critical locus which, which you've actually owned. Uh, and the other things are all to do with you have to first choose an embedding into some smooth space and then you get the zero locus of the function uh, and that's very non-canonical. Okay. Um, so let's finally move on to the Fukaya category business. Um, let's take S and only get a big complex symplectic manifold now, although the same discussion will work for algebraic symplectic manifolds. Um, and L and M be complex Lagrangians in S, which we're not going to suppose, suppose to be either compact or closed. So then the intersection <coughs> L intersect M has a complex analytic space, uh, has a decritical structure S, which uh, Vittorio Busi, my student, has proved. Um, hopefully the paper should be out on the archive in not very long. Um, if we choose also square into canonical bundles, we get an orientation on this um, decritical locus and therefore a perverse sheaf on it. And I claim that we should be thinking of the shifted hyper cohomology H star minus N of this perverse sheaf as a substitute for the Lagrangian Fleur cohomology in slip synthetic geometry. But this Lagrangian Fleur cohomology are the morphisms in the derived Fukaya category of F and omega, uh, at least if we were doing um, things in the real synthetic world. So here's the problem. If we're given a complex synthetic manifold S and omega, uh, we would like to build a Fukaya category whose objects are Lagrangians and square roots of their conical bundles, um, and whose graded morphisms are the hypercohomology of this perverse sheaf shifted by N. Uh, we'd like to extend this to derived Lagrangians, L in S omega in the sense of PTVV. Then we'd like to work out the right way to form a derived Fukaya category for this uh, as a possibly triangle tri 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 category. We'd also like to show that Lagrangian correspondences or derived Lagrangian correspondences induce functors between these derived, these derived Fukaya categories. So this would be a rather pretty picture. It would realize, at least in the complex symplectic world, a lot of stuff which people know how to do rather messily in the uh, real symplectic world. It would be quite useful for geometric representation theorists, I think, who, who quite like um, things which are basically um, Fukaya categories of complex Lagrangians and things. One extra question is whether we could include complex quiesotropic submanifolds as objects in this thing. Uh, my guess is that may be possible, but we don't want to be in the perverse sheaf world. We want to be in the D-module world. And that, you know, somehow these guys, uh, ordinary Lagrangian intersections will be corresponding to regular holonomic D-modules and quiesotropic intersections will correspond to some more general kind of D-module. Uh, yeah? I don't know. Um, or, or better yet, an infinity category. Uh, certainly an infinity, possibly DG, but uh, we're not far enough along in, in this project to know. Um, do you expect the higher multiplications to be zero or not? I don't know. I think that, that may depend on what model for, for the complexes we're choosing. 
Um, and there, there are natural things uh, which one would, which would be used for the higher multiplications. I, I actually wrote one down in yesterday's lecture. Anyway, that, can we talk about that later, perhaps? Okay, so this conjecture I talked about a little while ago is exactly what we need to define composition of morphisms in the Fukaya categories. Because uh, if we have three Lagrangians, L and M and N, then we have three pairwise intersections, M intersect L, N intersect M, L intersect N. They're all minus one shifted symplectic uh, drive schemes or decritical loci. And the triple intersection, L intersect M intersect N, is Lagrangian in the product of three, uh, as I said yesterday. So if we apply this conjecture to the triple intersection and we rearrange some things using Verge duality, we get a morphism of constructible complexes, mu, from the perverse sheaf from L insect M, tensored with the perverse sheaf from M insect N, shift of N, into the perverse sheaf from L insect N. Then we take hypercohomology of that morphism, we get a multiplication from HOM LM, tensed cross HOM MN into HOM LN in our pretend Foucault category. So um, that's good. Okay, now this is related to a story which several people here know more about than I do. Um, so Kashiwara and Shapira develop a theory of uh, deformation quantization modules or DQ modules on a complex symplectic manifold. So these are roughly symplectic versions of D modules, I think, or holonomic D modules. Uh, so holonomic DQ modules are supported, I believe, on Lagrangians, possibly singular. Um, and if you have a closed embedded complex Lagrangian in F and omega with uh, a choice of square root of um, it's Coronacle bundle. I be, believe that Andrea and Shapira construct a simple holonomic DQQ module, the L, supported on this Lagrangian L. Um, now, for Lagrangians L and M, I believe also that Kashiwara and Shapira show that the, uh, the internal home between DL and DM is a perverse sheaf over the field uh, <coughs> C of H, which is supported on the Lagrangian section. Uh, Pierre Chaparat also explained to me that this perverse sheaf ought to be isomorphic to our perverse sheaf, uh, provided we choose a base ring A to B C of H. Okay? So this is looking a lot like uh, the, the project I've just explained to you. Um, okay, so all this looks very, much, very similar to our complex Sukai category picture, but there are some puzzling differences. One is that our perverse sheaf picture works over an essentially arbitrary base ring A, so we could take, we could be working over the integers or the rationals, say, whereas these DQ module things uh, work over the base ring C of H only. Uh, so I do wonder whether our, our picture is somehow related to microlocal perverse sheaves rather than uh, D modules. Um, secondly, in our picture, we get natural monodromy operators and Verdier duality operators on our perverse sheaves. I was wondering whether this H bar here is actually encoding the monodromy operator, um, but I'm not sure about that. Thirdly, uh, our, the objects, well, our, our, drive, our objects are, live on a Lagrangian which has a morphism into S, but this morphism need not be an embedding. Um, L is allowed to be derived, so as a classical scheme, it has singularities. Holonomic D mo DQ modules, as I understand it, also live, well, it live on embedded Lagrangians, so that they really do live in, in the symplectic manifold. They don't map to it. Um, the Lagrangians are also allowed to be singular, but the singularities allowed, as far as I can see, look very different to the singularities which crop up in our picture. Um, so you know, I would like to understand the relation between these theories a bit better, and I'd be very interested to talk to people who uh, know anything about this. Okay, um, that's probably where I need to stop. Thank you.